She's the most magnificent, the most famous ship of all time. But her name alone spells disaster and high drama. This is the Titanic. Iceberg, go right ahead! James Cameron's blockbuster movie combines both the action and drama of the Titanic disaster. But what's true and what's made up? Kate Winslet's character Rose was pure fiction. But there was a young woman called Rosa on the Titanic, and she would face a very real tragedy. Scientists will discover why and how Titanic's hero, Jack Dawson, perished in the icy waters while his lover survived. And by creating the world's first virtual Titanic, researchers will discover whether the movie version of the fatal collision was anything like the real thing. The film turns historic events into one of the biggest movie dramas of all time. And the real story of Titanic is every bit as dramatic. December 19, 1997, six months late and way over budget. Some predict Titanic will be a $200 million flop. Instead, the world falls in love with the movie. And with 14 Oscars, it makes James Cameron king of the world. It is an extraordinary story, and I think a story that will remain forever young, despite it being almost 100 years old. Paul Loudon Brown, the film's historical advisor, worked on set with James Cameron, making sure the movie looked right. But even he admits that the movie script departs from reality in a big way. The story has almost been set since 1912. This wonderful ship sailing on its maiden voyage, uh, all these beautiful, rich people on board, the immigrants that died on board. I mean, it's a perfect story. But the reality is far from that. Southampton Harbour in southern England is still one of the world's busiest ports. Here's where Titanic pulled away from the quayside on her maiden voyage on Wednesday, April 10th, 1912. She offers unimaginable luxury on the premier transatlantic route to New York. She promises total safety, too. Her owners say Titanic is unsinkable. It's Sunday, April 14th. It should be only another 48 hours plain sailing before Titanic arrives at Pier 59 in New York to a triumphant welcome. There are 2,223 people aboard, and the movie paints an accurate portrait of the social divisions. Titanic's 337 first-class passengers are on decks B and C. Among the 285 second-class passengers, there's school teacher Lawrence Beasley, on his way to visit his brother in Chicago. His first-hand account will become one of the main inspirations for the movie script. It was a beautiful sight to one who had not crossed the ocean before, to stand on the top deck and watch the swell of the sea. And each night, the sun sank right in our eyes, making a glittering pathway, a golden track on the surface of the ocean, which our ship followed unswervingly until the sun dipped below the edge of the horizon. Many of the characters we see in the movie are based on fact. 
But how about the two we see most of all? There's no one called Jack Dawson on board. Nor is there a Rose aboard Titanic, a young woman in first class being railroaded into marriage. Titanic's hero and heroine are a scriptwriter's invention. But their fictional fight for survival has some basis in fact. Thirty-nine-year-old English-born Rosa Abbott, one of the 721 passengers in third class, is traveling with her two boys. Ross, who's 16, and Eugene, who's 13. They're going to visit relatives in the USA and already have many stories to tell about their incredible voyage. The tragedy is only one of these three will survive the terror of the next few hours. It's at precisely 1140 that passengers who are still awake hear and feel something odd. It's not yet time to be scared, but that time will come. St. John's, Newfoundland is the scene for a unique experiment to discover the real story of Titanic. It's a seafaring city and the closest to where Titanic went down in 1912. The city's perched on the edge of a piece of ocean they call Iceberg Alley. The iceberg which sank Titanic sailed right by here, headed south a short time before the disaster. Here in St. John's, in the largest marine simulator in the world, sea captains test their skills to the very limit. They learn how to sail virtual vessels from a life-size bridge, facing any dangers the technology can throw at them. From dense fog, to a howling hurricane, to icebergs. This is a very good representation. This is an average working day quite often on the Grand Banks. Captain Chris Hearn has commanded ships all over the world. Now, in the world's first ever full-scale simulation, he'll take command on board a virtual Titanic to put the movie version to the test. In the movie, it takes two minutes and 14 seconds from the time the iceberg is sighted to the moment of collision. But how can that be? Records show Titanic was traveling at more than 20 knots, around 25 miles an hour. That means the iceberg would have been almost a mile away when first sighted, leaving plenty of time to turn. So what really happened? Using historical data from the original shipbuilders, the simulator support team first inputs the exact dimensions, engine size, and handling characteristics of Titanic herself. When the wheel is turned, or power applied, she'll behave exactly like the real vessel. Titanic is ready to be launched once again on a unique voyage of discovery. Just as on the night Titanic sank, a lookout is posted to warn of any approaching danger. And another officer will relay his warning to the officer in charge. Here's what really happened on the night of the disaster. team have factored in another piece of key data. Records show Titanic managed to turn exactly 21 degrees to the left as she approached the bird. The virtual Titanic follows the same course. Her crew prayed it would be enough to avoid disaster 
We almost just cleared. The helm was put over, the engines were stopped, the vessel had just started to work its way clear of the iceberg, and unfortunately it caught it on the, uh, on the fine on the starboard bow. The collision happens at exactly 52 seconds, less than half the time it took in the movie. Dramatic scenes show Titanic's engines going into reverse, but this simulation proves that that's impossible. It all happens much quicker than in the movie. For several minutes that would have had to occur before they were able to actually start reversing the engine. With a large steam vessel, like the Titanic, there's a unique combination of events that have to occur in the engine room. By the time I ring back on the telegraphs, the engineer responds back to me. The time he's going to take to be able to work the engines in the reverse, to stop them and then start them the other way, it takes a long time. The simulation reveals for the first time the actual distance of the iceberg from Titanic. It wasn't a mile, as the movie suggests, but instead just 640 yards. This data gives Captain Hearn the chance to settle a question which has haunted him for years. Was Titanic's captain to blame for the disaster? Captain Edward Smith was probably the most experienced and highest paid sea captain in the world, with 40 years experience behind him. In the movie, he's portrayed as a company man, reluctant to act on his own initiative. The movie historian Paul Loudon Brown says the real story is even worse. Captain Smith was really too old to be in command. He was brought in to take Titanic for one last voyage. He had had a couple of near misses in other ships coming into New York Harbor where he had refused the assistance of tugs and had literally done what would be called today the, the equivalent of doing a handbrake turn bumping the pier and causing some minor damage to vessels. He had been fortunate, he had got away with things. Captain Smith receives warnings by wireless that icebergs have been spotted in exactly the area where Titanic is headed. He could slow down for safety, but his passengers have families waiting, hotel rooms booked. The press will be out in force at the advertised time of arrival. Smith keeps going at 20 knots. But what would our modern day captain do? In a particularly dark night, late the night the Titanic sank, we want to be going along at a speed that allows you to maneuver, but also to proceed with enough distance, with enough space to be able to take action. If you arrive on something too quickly, you can't really do anything. Myself, I think I would have been traveling around 10 knots. I don't think I would have been doing a full speed. I would have slowed down. Technicians reset the simulator so that Titanic will be traveling at just 10 knots, roughly 12 miles an hour. But will this be enough to save the ship? Bridge. Captain Iceberg reported head ahead. Hard to starboard. Hard to starboard. This time, Titanic is approaching at less than half the speed she was traveling the first time around. I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna miss. It gives more time for the turn to take effect. But is it enough time? My God, we missed it. Our report. I've given the order hard to port now because my bow has cleared the piece of ice and I have to be aware that the rest of the vessel is behind me and I want to swing the ship clear of the piece of ice now. We've cleared. We've cleared the iceberg. The experiment proves once and for all that Titanic would not have sunk if she'd slowed her speed. She'd have made New York two days late, but 1,500 people would not have died.
as the ship strikes, just as in the movie, passengers have no real sense of what's happened. There came what seemed to me nothing more than an extra heave of the engines. Nothing more than that. No sound of a crash, no sense of shock, no jar that felt like one heavy body meeting another. And all this time, the Titanic was being cut open by the iceberg and water was pouring in her side. And yet, no evidence that would indicate such a disaster had been presented to us. Though nobody on board yet realizes it, Titanic's fate is sealed. The iceberg has cut a hole in Titanic's side below the waterline. It's only two inches wide, but it runs intermittently for 300 feet. How does the glancing blow have such a catastrophic effect? The captain of the Titanic tried to uh, turn away from the iceberg. And because of that, the impact ripped a gouge along the side of the Titanic, uh, puncturing a number of compartments. Dr. Robert Gagnon understands the Titanic disaster may be better than anyone else in the world. Over 10 years, he has gathered a unique set of data by deliberately smashing ships into icebergs. This was the first time that a ship ever collided with an iceberg intentionally to gain information about the forces and the pressures associated with the collisions. He uses a tough icebreaker equipped with pressure sensors to measure the force of impact during a collision with an iceberg. This one, weighing around 2,000 tons, is many times smaller than the one Titanic encountered. But even at a speed of 10 knots, the impact momentarily exceeds one million pounds of force, about the same as the thrust of the space shuttle's main engines at liftoff. Titanic struck a glancing blow. But what if she plowed straight into the iceberg instead? What would have happened had the impact been a head-on collision rather than a glancing blow? That's a, a very good question. Many ships, in fact, can survive a head-on collision. We've had ships come into the harbor here that sustained head-on impacts with icebergs and were able to steam into the harbor. but. They didn't sink. The front end of the vessel is designed to crumple and uh, sustain some damage without that damage propagating into the important compartments of the vessel. Since the movie came out, another theory has emerged to explain why, in just seconds, Titanic split wide open. North Atlantic icebergs aren't frozen seawater. They're huge chunks of freshwater ice, born from immense glaciers on the west coast of Greenland. During the 5,000-year journey of the glacier across land, it also picks up pieces of rock. These sometimes remain embedded in the iceberg, like a super-hard blade in the ice. What we've got here is actually a rock that's recovered from the Titanic debris field. Larry Daly has dived with James Cameron to the wreck of Titanic. On one of their dives, he spotted a strange object and had the submersible bring it to the surface. I was in Mirror One during uh, some work I was doing with Jim Cameron back in 2003. But what's interesting about this rock is that you would not normally find this rock on the ocean floor in the area where the Titanic wreck lies because these rocks are from Greenland. To get out that far, it would have to get there uh, by an iceberg. So the iceberg would have carried it from Greenland and out to the site where the Titanic sank. This is possibly a stone or a rock from the iceberg that sank Titanic. 
There's also evidence that this lethal iceberg didn't even have to cut through steel to sink the Titanic. In Belfast, Northern Ireland, in the very same dock where Titanic was built, a full-scale section of the ship's bow has been remade using a century-old technique. The practice of joining steel plates together with rivets contained a fatal flaw. For years, we thought there was a gash ripped into the side of the Titanic, but in point of fact, what happened was the plates themselves were buckled by the sheer mass of the iceberg. This caused the rivets, the heads to be ripped off, or the rivets to loosen up, and the watertight integrity between the two plates was lost, and the water got between the two plates, and this is what caused this long, continuous flooding over almost 300 feet of the forward part of the Titanic. The tough ice, reinforced with rock, combined with Titanic's attempt to swerve round the iceberg, result in the worst possible scenario. The 300-foot gash lets water pour into five of Titanic's watertight compartments. At 12.05, Captain Smith learns the full extent of the damage. Titanic has been built to survive four compartments being punctured and still remain afloat. But with five taking in water, Smith knows that the ship will sink. Titanic's captain could order an emergency evacuation. The real story of why he doesn't was in the early versions of the movie script, but then dropped. The true story is far less dramatic than the screen version. But it explains why those on board still thought they were safe. One almost finds oneself screaming at the screen, get into a lifeboat, do what you can to save yourself, and they don't. The Titanic disaster completely changed the law of the sea on how many lifeboats a ship has to carry. Nowadays, there has to be a lifeboat seat available for every passenger. And modern ships have to carry covered lifeboats, unlike the open boats on Titanic that night. There are still a fair old number of these in service on some of the older cruise liners and, and passenger ferries around the world, so um, still good old workhorses and fulfilling the roles of lifeboats today. No need to row them as they would have in the Titanic's days, but the shape and the sort of capabilities of it pretty much representative of uh, what was around then. As the movie depicts, Titanic carried 20 lifeboats. They could carry 1,200 people, but there were 2,200 aboard. It sounds crazy, but in 1912, the Atlantic was so full of ships, it seemed completely safe. When you watch Titanic, you get the sense that she sailed on virtually an empty ocean. And the reality is far from that. They nicknamed the North Atlantic Run the Transatlantic Railway. There were so many ships sailing across that route, east to west and west to east, that there would be always the opportunity of coming across another vessel in a disaster situation. That's why Titanic's 20 lifeboats were thought to be plenty, with ships nearby always ready to help. Lifeboats in 1912 were seen not as actually there primarily to save life. If a ship was in distress, the passengers would literally be ferried from one vessel to another. So it wasn't necessary to have lifeboat space for every single passenger on board. On the night of the disaster, everything seemed to be following this rescue scenario. Titanic's crew really did believe they'd be rescued long before the ship reached the point of sinking. At the night of the 14th of April, 1912, when Titanic is sailing from east to west, she's not the only ocean liner on the Atlantic that night. There are literally dozens of other vessels traveling east to west or west to east. And ahead of Titanic is an ice field flowing from north to south, drifting right across the course of Titanic. <laughs> 
About 50 miles to the south is the Cunard liner Carpathia, and to the north of Titanic, another vessel, the Californian. She was stopped on account of the ice field, and her engines were at standby. And as Titanic strikes the iceberg and sends out her distress calls, she sights this vessel, sometimes called the mystery vessel, but almost undoubtedly the Californian. As the movie depicts, when the first lifeboat is eventually launched, it has only 28 people on board and 37 empty seats. The reason it's so empty is that Titanic's officers think there's another ship close by. The officers on board the Titanic that night were concerned about the stresses placed on those boats by overloading them, so they thought that the best solution would be to get the boats into the water, lightly loaded, and then to use them as a ferry service between vessels. No one is panicking because of the ship, which seems close enough to rescue them. Lawrence Beasley reports it's so close that officers signal to her by Morse land. The vessel was a small steamer some few miles ahead on the port side. Captain Smith saw her quite plainly some five miles away and could distinguish the masthead lights and a red port light. So why doesn't the other ship come to Titanic's rescue? Despite Beasley's first-hand account and later testimony by Titanic's officers, it seems they were wrong about how close the other ship was. The unusual weather that night offers a possible explanation. Titanic's officers might be looking at just the ghostly image of a ship, a mirage caused by a rare optical illusion known as super refraction. Even in normal weather, objects just over the horizon sometimes appear visible because light waves are refracted, that is, bent, by cool air near the ocean surface. Captain Francois Hugo has been at sea for 35 years and he's a specialist in meteorology. He's studied the strange weather conditions of the night of the disaster. There was a flat calm, crystal clear visibility, with the sea close to freezing point. The surface of the sea was colder than usual, so the air in contact with it would have been colder than usual, and therefore denser than usual and therefore the refraction would have been greater, which is described as super refraction. The mystery ship that appeared to be close was in fact much too far away to help. The Titanic's bridge is about 65 feet above sea level. At that height, the normal horizon is about nine miles from the vessel. The Californian's bridge was a little bit lower, but has a similar visibility. And they were approximately 18 miles apart. So with normal refraction, they were just out of sight of each other. And so it's very probable that with super refraction at those ranges, um, the two ships could see each other. The Californian's wireless set was switched off that night. And though her officers later admitted they'd seen Titanic in the distance, they didn't realize she was in trouble. This analysis could clear up one of the enduring mysteries of that night and also explain another great riddle of the Titanic disaster. The story of the mystery ship which failed to help Titanic was eventually dropped from the movie but it plays a critical part in understanding the real story of why passengers weren't rushing to escape. The passengers really didn't have cues from their external environment or from the other people that they were at risk. Dr. Dan Kruger is a psychologist who studied the Titanic disaster. He's analyzed the first-hand account left by Lawrence Beasley there really wasn't much of an indication that the ship was sinking. It was only when Lawrence Beasley 
was descending some stairs that he noticed his balance was slightly off from what it should be, that he realized that the boat was in fact starting to pitch. Kruger has compared the Titanic disaster and another famous shipwreck, the Lusitania, which was torpedoed in 1915 during World War I. The Titanic took over two hours to sink, whereas the Lusitania sank within 20 minutes. So there was a much greater sense of common order in the Titanic, whereas the Lusitania felt much more like a crisis situation. The preservation of the social order seems to have been much more prominent on the Titanic than on the Lusitania, where it really did seem to be you know, every person is fending for themselves, and those who fended the best were the ones who survived. The movie highlights the huge gulf between first class and third class, but the statistics on who really came off worse reveal a startling truth. It was men in second class who suffered the highest death rate of all. Only 8% survived, half the number of third class men. The second class men didn't have the social prestige and standing to be favored by the captain and the crew in the first wave of the rescue. And at the same time, they might not have had the physical prowess of some of the third class passengers to fight their way through the chaos. We're doing really good work. It's not necessary for you all to go on lifeboats at this moment. By 1.40, two hours after the collision, Lawrence Beasley reports how the atmosphere on board is changing rapidly. The panic is this stage is just women and children in the boat. Titanic's bow is dipping ever deeper in the water. It's clear to everyone on board that she is going to sink and no rescue ship has arrived. Beasley, one of the few male second-class survivors, has almost given up hope when he's given a place in lifeboat number 13. Sir, I've taken. For Titanic's Captain Smith, there'll be no escape. He'll go down with his ship. So does that make him a hero? Captain Smith wasn't a hero that night. He is the architect of the disaster because of his ineffectual management of the situation. And that can only be put down to the fact that he had some sort of nervous collapse. As confusion mounted, rockets were fired to call for help. Maybe now the Californian will come speeding to the rescue. But it turns out the rockets were fired in the wrong sequence. Nobody seeing them would have thought Titanic was even in trouble. When you have the rockets being fired from Titanic, they are not in the accepted way that signals of distress were fired at one minute intervals. They were fired randomly, so another steamer might misconstrue those as Titanic, perhaps signaling to a vessel further to the south. The whole command structure fell apart, but at the heart of it, at the head of it, was Captain Smith to make sure that everybody did what they were told, and he didn't do that. I believe he's responsible for 700 unnecessary deaths. In a dead flat calm as it was that night, he should have, as, as a competent seaman, taken the risk and overloaded those boats. And instead, you have boats leaving the Titanic only partially filled. By 1.55, the last of the 16 full-sized lifeboats has left the ship. Only four remain collapsible boats with canvas sides designed to hold 40 people. Rosa Abbott, the third class passenger traveling with her two boys, now faces an agonizing decision. Like Rose in the movie, Rosa has been offered a seat in a lifeboat. But the youngsters are regarded as men, just like Jack Dawson, and told they have to stay.
Rosa refuses to abandon her children. They'll face what's coming together. At 2 a.m., amid scenes of growing terror, Rosa Abbott and her boys have reached Titanic's upper deck when the unthinkable happens. Rosa, her two boys, and many of the remaining 1,500 passengers are hurled into the icy ocean. In the chaos, Rosa loses contact with her children. Moments later, more dead than alive, she finds herself close to a lifeboat. Rosa is dragged from the freezing ocean in a scene which mirrors Rose and Jack's final moments together in the movie. Stay on it. Stay on, Rose. Jack won't make it, and neither will Rose's teenage boys. The body of Ross will be recovered later. That of Eugene will never be found. But why did they perish before rescuers arrived? Dr. Mike Tipton is a world authority on extreme survival and has studied what killed the victims of Titanic. This experiment will test the truth of what we see in the movie, with volunteer Martin Barwood taking the place of Jack Dawson. Before the test begins, the team measure the subject's manual dexterity. Stop. And also his grip strength. It'll help them determine how the cold affects his physical capabilities. A thermal camera, which detects body heat, will give an instant image of how his body reacts to the cold. Three, two, one. The sea temperature around Titanic was close to freezing point. For safety, medics have decided to run this test in water at 53.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But the effects are still potentially lethal and need to be closely monitored. That type of ventilation that we're seeing there is absolutely classic cold shock response. The sudden fall in skin temperature is stimulating cold receptors and that are sending lots of information back into the central nervous system, driving breathing. The really dangerous phase is that phase in the first 30 seconds to one minute where breathing is out of control. Many of the Titanic victims drowned from the shock of hitting the freezing ocean, which forced them to breathe underwater. But by far, the biggest killer was hypothermia, with males, like Jack, being more vulnerable than females, like Rose. It's a pretty horrible experience that you get, and that's coupled with some sort of feelings of lightheadedness and nearing unconsciousness. The rate at which Martin falls is going to be largely dependent on the amount of subcutaneous fat he has, and he doesn't have very much subcutaneous fat. On average, women have about 10% more body fat. Certainly in terms of prolonged immersion and cooling, one would expect to see females do better in cold water because they have more body fat. After 23 minutes, they have to call a halt. The subject's core temperature has dropped from 98.9 to 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. At 95 degrees, Barwood would become clinically hypothermic. These thermal images show how his skin temperature has plunged. 
By comparing the color of his fingertips before and after, researchers see that the temperature there has dropped from 73.4 to 59 degrees. The idea that the heroine survives whilst the hero sinks to the deep is not too far from the physiological truth. Once the volunteers had time to recover, the team want to gather a second set of data. First time around, he was static in the water. But what of those Titanic passengers who tried to swim for their lives? It's quite hard to sustain the stroke, particularly my arms, compared to the static condition I feel like I'm getting cold much quicker. Instead of warming them up, the increased blood flow loses heat even faster. It's the worst thing they could have done. They reach the safety cutoff point this time after just 14 minutes. He's lost heat almost twice as quickly as before. What we'll do is we'll just ask you to do this grip strength in the thumb bolt test. When they repeat the manual tests, it's clear Barwood can hardly use his hands at all. His dexterity has fallen by 60% his strength by 30%. These results show that once the passengers hit the water, they were doomed. Only six people were saved from the sea. The lifeboats should have carried 1,200 people, but roughly 500 seats remained empty. Why didn't they return to help those in the water? Officers said they feared being swamped by those in the water. But would that really have happened? It's really very difficult to get into a lifeboat or a life raft. Once you've been in ice cold water for a very short period of time, it becomes near impossible. So it's much more likely that uh, those people who are going to enter a life raft or a lifeboat will only have done so with the assistance of people already in the boat. That's exactly what happens to Rosa Abbott, the only woman to be dragged from the water that night and survive. At 4 a.m., four and a half hours after the iceberg strike, the liner Carpathia appears on the horizon. These are the photographs taken from the deck of Carpathia. She's picked up radio calls and steamed more than 50 miles at top speed. She takes aboard just 700 people of the 2,200 who embarked on Titanic four days earlier. When the news breaks, it unleashes headlines around the world. Among the grim facts and figures, the legends begin to appear almost right away with stories of fabulous treasures going down with the ship. Titanic's movie plot line centers around the hunt for a fabulous jewel, the heart of the ocean. But is there any truth in that story? Apart from gold coins that would be held on board the Titanic uh, that belonged to the White Star Line to pay duties wherever she called. There wasn't really anything of any historical or commercial value that went down with the ship. It makes a good driver for a film about the Titanic that there is a, a dive going on and a search for a, a fantastic gem. But the reality is, I'm afraid, that there is no heart of the ocean lying inside Titanic. The real Rose of Titanic, Rosa Abbott, lived to the age of 73, but never fully recovered emotionally or physically from her terrible ordeal. She died in London in 1946. Although Jack Dawson was entirely fictional, a cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia, has become his shrine, all on account of the movie. 23-year-old Joseph Dawson, a stoker from Dublin, went down with the ship and is buried here. But movie fans prefer to believe their hero lies here and keep the memorial tended with flowers. Titanic's story would be told and retold in hundreds of books and no less than eight feature films over the next century.
James Cameron's movie is scheduled for re-release in 3D on the 100th anniversary of Titanic sinking in 2012. For each new generation, the story has a new fascination. It's one of those rare events in human history where the real story is more remarkable and more tragic than anything the movie makers could invent. <laughs>